Oh, we're alive now. Hello, developers. Good night for those who see us now. Today, I'm here with Simon Prickett. Simon is a senior software developer and technical trainer. He will speak with us about probability data structures with Python and Redis. Hello, Simon. How are you? Hello, I'm very well, thanks. Uh, I'm in the UK where it's currently midnight, so it's uh, great to be talking to you folks. And uh, hopefully, um, I will stay awake and alert throughout this, but I'm sure we'll be good. Yeah, it, it, for sure you'll have a cup of coffee, of coffee with you. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, guys, don't forget to subscribe, to share with your friends, to stay tuned with our social medias and everything. And now I will just uh, let Simon do his show. And I think that's it. Simon, it's up to you. Okay, thanks very much. Um, we have some slides to add in here. There we go. So, hi, good evening, um, and possibly good other times of day, because I think we're streaming this to YouTube, so we could have people from everywhere. Uh, this is a talk that's called No, Maybe, and Close Enough, um, and it was actually uh, premiered at, at PyCon USA earlier this year, and I'll be doing it again at PyCon Australia. Um, but this is the first time I'm doing a longer version of it. So uh, we have some extra content that if you've seen this on YouTube before, you won't have seen the, uh, the extra content. So what are we gonna talk about? Um, we are gonna talk about uh, using probabilistic data structures. I'm gonna explain what those are a little bit. And we're gonna use those with Python as an example programming language. But if you're not a Python programmer, the same concepts apply to uh, other languages especially when you're using something like Redis to implement these data structures, because you can access that from pretty much anything. So I myself am more a Node.js type of programmer. Um, so Python's a little bit out of my normal wheelhouse, but um, it's a good language to demonstrate these things in, and there's nothing that's peculiar to Python. So um, who am I? I'm a senior curriculum engineer at Redis Labs, uh, which basically means that I write and produce and sometimes appear in online training. So you'll see me in our uh, Redis for JavaScript developers course, and you'll see me writing stuff on the internet. Uh, one of my hobbies outside of coding is coding. So um, I write a lot of stuff for the Raspberry Pi and the Arduino um, with a little bit of hardware. It's kind of a fun, Thing to do outside of just pure software at work. I'm on Twitter. You can follow me there if you, you're interested in that. Um, and also, if you want to chat about Redis or probabilistic data structures or anything that you see here or, or in this wider month of events that the group's holding, then um, jump on our Discord. We have, uh, it's the Redis open source community. We have lots and lots of uh, folks on there from the company and the wider open source. And we basically have discussions about all things Redis. So it's enough about me. Um, let's dive in. So what are we going to cover today? Um, we're going to look at what on the face of it looks like a really, really simple problem. We're going to count some things. So that should be quite easy, right? We all know how to count things. Um, and we're also going to try and remember if we've seen a specific thing. So we're going to count distinct things. Um, often we would do that with something that models a mathematical set, and we'll have a look at how good that is for doing that, and what some problems with it might be. So we'll start off looking at counting things with a set in memory. Then we'll start looking at how we can use a database, so in this case, specifically Redis, to count those same things and to check if we've seen them before. And then we'll think about what some trade-offs are with being right all the time. So. Yeah, we're generally brought up to believe that if we can be right all the time about things, then that's great. That's how we get like the top marks in exams. That's how we do well in life. Um, sometimes it's actually better not to be 100% right about things. And we'll look at why that might be in this case. And we're going to do that by looking at two what are called probabilistic data structures. So I'll explain what those are and how they work. And the ones we're going to look at are a hyperloglog, -log, which is a way of approximating um, the cardinality of a set or how many things we've seen, and a bloom filter, which is a way of uh, efficiently remembering if we've seen a specific thing. 
We'll then look at when we want, might want to use probabilistic data structures. And the flip side of that is when we might not want to use them because they're not appropriate for everything. And finally, sort of as a little bit more uh, of interest for you to go and research on, on your own time, we'll look at what other probabilistic data structures exist outside of the two that we're going to see today. So the problem domain that we're looking at here is a pretty, on the face of it, simple one. We want to count some things. So how many things do we have? And we want to know if we've seen a particular thing already. So one of the things with counting distinct things, so imagine if we have a flock of sheep here and all of those sheep have tags on their ears that have like a unique serial number, so a sheep ID that we use to track things like what vaccinations has this sheep had, um, you know, what we're gonna do with it in the future, where its wool is going to go, uh, the entire life cycle of the animal will track by this ID. So a given sheep might be known as like sheep 9204, and we might want to record things against it. So one of the things we need to do is figure out how many sheep we've got in a given space. So we want to count the sheep, uh, which is kind of a classic counting problem. And in order to count them distinctly, we have to remember which ones we've seen already so that we know when we scan or look at another ear tag, is this a, a new one? So do we add one to the total of number of sheep we've seen already? Or is this one that we've seen already and we can just disregard it? Um, and then the other thing we might want to know is, have I seen this sheep? So if like a certain sheep's due for vaccination, we might want to know if we've seen it. Has it been tagged in this field recently? Um, is it a member of the set of sheep that are in this field, for example? So on the face of it, this is really, really easy problem to solve in most programming languages. And we can solve it right here in Python very, very simply um, at one level. So Python has a set and that set models a mathematical set, which basically means that we can add uh, members to it. So here I'm adding a load of sheep IDs. So sheep 1934, sheep 1201, et cetera. And one of the properties of a set as opposed to another data structure is that we're not allowing duplicates in there. So we can add uh, the same sheep ID tag as many times as we like, and we'll only store one copy of that in the set, and the size of the set will reflect that there's only one of these. So sets allow us to count unique items, which is exactly what we want to do. So here I'm adding, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven sheep, but I've added 1934 twice. Maybe we caught that one twice while we were scanning the ear tags. Um, so I would expect the size of this set or the cardinality of it, as mathematicians call it, to be six. So we had seven tags that we've seen. We had a duplicate one uh, that got deduplicated. So we've seen six distinct sheep. Um, problem solved, no external libraries required, no database required, all good. We've just done it with Python's built-in set. So the second, um, question that we wanted to ask about our data set of sheep here is, have I seen this particular sheep? So if I put a load of sheep into a set, so I'm doing that at the top there, so imagine we've scanned all of those and we've added them to the set, then determining when I scan a sheep, if we've seen this one already, um, we could do it in two ways. We could check if the size of the set changes because we don't allow duplicates. But if we don't wanna add things to the set, we just want to see if we've seen the sheep before, then that's not, not a good approach. So what we need to do is just basically check is the sheep tag that we're looking for in the set of sheep tags that we've currently seen. So I have a simple function there that basically literally says if the sheep ID that we're looking for is in the set of sheep that we've seen, then yes, print we've seen it. Otherwise, no, we haven't. Um, so we can say, have I seen 1934? 1934 was in our set of sheep. So yeah, we absolutely have seen that one. We know with 100% certainty because the set is telling us that. And I can say, have I seen sheep 1283? And that wasn't in the set of sheep that we've seen already. So we know with absolute certainty that that ID is not in there and it's going to say, no, I haven't seen it. So 
when we're using a set like this, which is a built-in data structure in the language and JavaScript, Node.js has one. Similarly, most other programming languages have something that models a mathematical set. Then we can solve this problem with 100% accuracy in a minimum amount of code with no dependencies. So that's basically it. Um, we've solved the problem. We've got nothing to do here. So we can all go home and then the meet up early. But is that actually really the case? Well, at the small scale, yeah, it probably is. If we're counting like a small number of things and we want one thing to count them, then using like an in-process uh, data structure that sits in memory inside the process is probably okay. We can count a small number of things. But people have a lot of stuff um, and sheep farms have a lot of sheep. If you go to somewhere like Australia or New Zealand, there are sheep farms with many, many hundreds of thousands of sheep or, or more. Um, and here we're counting things on a much, much bigger scale. And that starts to introduce a few problems. So the way that we got a really accurate count by using a set was by remembering every single sheep tag that we'd seen. So we actually stored the data. And the problem with that is every time we see a new and different sheep, we're burning up some storage. So we were using in-memory storage in the Python process. And we're gonna keep building up that storage and the more and more sheep we see, the more we're gonna use. And you know, storage is finite in memory. We are gonna run out of that at some point. And we're gonna have a problem on our hands that we can't keep counting the sheep in this way. The other problem we've got is if you have this many things to count, and it's just you doing it, it's gonna take a long time. So in sort of server speak, we would want to do some horizontal scaling here. So imagine I had people in a field with barcode scanners and they could scan the sheep. We would wanna have several people scanning these sheep so that we could get through the field faster. But we can't all maintain a sort of unique count on our handheld devices or whatever. We need something that's centrally counting these sheep and deduplicating any in case I scan a sheep and then somebody else scans the same sheep um, as far as we are going through the field. And so we have these two problems with scale. We have basically a resource problem that's a runaway problem. Um, and we have a throughput problem. So we need to be able to do this more efficiently and potentially with uh, less memory use. So those are the sort of problems that we're starting to, to see here. So generally, as things get big, we're gonna run into memory problems, horizontal scaling problems, and the requirement of having an exact count of something starts to actually get quite expensive, both in terms of time or computational complexity and memory usage. And if our IDs were really big, like imagine they were you know, quite a long stream of numbers or um, we were counting something like the bits in a JPEG image to see if we'd seen like a unique frame from a video camera or something, then the actual data itself gets really, really big. So that memory usage problem is also proportionate to the size of the ID we're storing as well as the number of the IDs. So, one of the ways that we might want to solve some of these problems would be by moving the data set out of, in our case, the Python program and into something else. So ideally that something else would be on a server so it can be shared and enable horizontal scaling. So multiple clients could talk to it and send data to it. And ideally it would be something that has a more efficient use of memory or more memory available to it. So we are gonna look at using a database for that. So rather than counting stuff in memory in Python, we're gonna move that into a database. And I have, obviously this is a Redis talk, so I funnily enough chosen Redis to do this. Um, this wasn't an arbitrary choice necessarily. There are some good reasons to do this. Um, Redis is a key value store that keeps the copy of the data set in memory. So it's extremely fast because all the reads come from memory. Um, it has a built-in set data type. So we don't need to build 
some data type in there. We can just use its set type. We can add things to a Redis set. It will behave like we saw with the Python set. If we add duplicate IDs, it will deduplicate those for us. Um, the API for using it is very, very similar to what we saw in Python. There's a function for adding things, and there's a function for getting the uh, the cardinality or the size of the set. There's another function for determining if something's in a set. Um, and then importantly for when we want to add more than one counter, so more than one process or person counting things, um, Operations in Redis are generally atomic. So set operations are atomic. If we add something to a set and someone else adds something to a set, it'll get duplicated. If we're checking for membership, that'll be done at a point in time. Um, Redis is actually mostly single threaded. So this is easy for it to implement. It basically just runs commands in order it receives them. So we won't have any issues with tramping on each other's toes. Um, the way sets are built in Redis as well is very efficient. So we need to add things to a set and we need to do a membership check. Uh, both of those are big O of one operations, which is basically as efficient as they get. And what that means is as the data size grows, so the number of sheep tags we have seen uh, gets bigger, the time complexity to insert something or to check if something is already inserted does not grow in proportion with the size of the data set. So we can keep adding things to, to the Redis set and our code for adding things and checking if they exist will not uh, slow down. So that's great. We've potentially solved quite a number of problems with this. And if we go and look at how to do this, um, I've got a terminal here. We can take a quick look at some Redis commands for this. So clear the terminal, make it nice and big. And what we want to do here is um, add some IDs to a set and see if they exist. We'll do that in sort of Redis CLI speak first using Redis commands. And then we'll look at how it works in Python. So I'm here in the Redis CLI, which is a tool for interactively working with Redis. And the command to add something to a set is sAd, so set add. Everything lives at a key, so we're going to give it a key name. And then we'll give it a member, or in our case, a sheep ID that we want to add. And we'll look at how we can work with that set. So I'm going to call my set uh, sheep IDs. So if we check if that exists already, we can do exists sheep IDs. And we get the answer zero, which means it doesn't exist. Um, one of the, oops, help if I spelt it correctly as well. Sheep IDs still doesn't exist. So one of the cool things with Redis that developers generally really like and find is great for adopting it is there's no create steps for the majority of things. So we don't have to say, I want to create a set in Redis here. We just get on with adding stuff to one. So sheep IDs doesn't exist as a key. There's nothing in the data store for that. But if I do set add a sheep IDs and I give it some IDs, so 1934, 2209, 1123, uh, and then we get the response four saying it's added four IDs to that set. Um, we can now ask Redis some questions about this set like um, S is member, which is Redis speak for is something in the set. So set is member. Oh, I spelled the key name wrong again. OK, we'll just run with that seeing as I can't. So the key name and 1934, and we get a 1. Yes, 1934 is in the set. So we can say we've seen that one before. If we try 1935, no, it's not in there. And we can be certain about this because it's still a set and we have all of the data that we entered in the set. And we can prove that by saying to Redis uh, what members are in the set. So I can say set members and my badly spelt ID. And we can actually get back all of the data that we put in. Um, finally, how many IDs are in the set? How many sheep have we got today? We use the set card or set cardinality command here and say, yes. EP IDs, and we should get four back. 
So we got four sheep in there. So this is a pretty uh, easy to work with data structure. That's pretty much everything we need to know about it to, to build some code that answers these questions. So let's take a look at how that works. So here we've got some Python code where we're going to look at answering the question, how many sheep do we have with Redis or how many have we seen? Um, so there's a little bit more code than when we used the Python set because obviously we're now using a Redis set which lives on a server and we're using a Redis client or a driver to access Redis. So here I'm just setting up the Redis connection. Uh, I'm using the defaults. I'm not specifying a host or a port or a password. It's just connecting to Redis on my local machine. And I'm just setting a constant uh, for what key we're going to work with in Redis. And I've actually spelled it correctly in this case. Um, so what we're then going to do is delete anything that is at that key already. So we'll clear out any old data. And then we'll use the sadd function on the Redis client, which maps to the sadd command that you saw me using in Redis CLI. And we'll say sadd some IDs to, to that key. And I've got the same set of IDs as I have before. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, but there's one duplicate in there. So 1934 gets added twice, and um, that will get deduplicated by Redis, the same as it, it did with the Python set. So when we run this code, we'd expect it to say there are however many sheep the Redis S card or set cardinality command returns for this key. And that's going to be six because we put seven IDs in, but we had one duplicate. So this is great in that it also allows us to run multiple processes. So uh, rather than our set being stuck inside the, the memory of one of those Python processes on the right, it's now in a shared server. And as many processes as we want can access that in order to either add new sheep or check how many sheep there are. So moving along to the next question that we wanted to ask was, have I seen this particular sheep? So if I've got a sheep ID, is it in the set of things that we've seen? Um, here again, we've got some preamble to set up just a Redis connection and define a key name. I'm clearing out the data and adding some sample data. And then my have I seen function that in Python was uh, basically just a, a very simple, if the uh, sheep ID is in the set, print one thing, otherwise print another thing, is pretty much the same now we've moved the data to Redis. So I'm just using the s is member command in Redis, so the set is member um, command, and saying, is the ID of the sheep that we are looking for in the set? And if I get true back, we know it is. And if I get false back, we know it isn't. So I would expect 1934 to return true. I would expect 1283 there to return false. Um, so again, we've got, we now solve some of these problems. Um, we've got something that multiple process can access. We can scale the memory use outside of those processes using Redis. Uh, we've got an efficient way of adding and checking membership. And, um, that looks pretty good on the face of it. So we move things to a database, and what's wrong with this? Um, generally, what's wrong with this is we still have the problem of we are still actually remembering all of the data that we've seen. So every new sheet we've seen chips away at the memory available to Redis. And if those IDs are long, then that memory is, uh, you know, more of that memory will be required. So as we see millions and millions and millions of sheep, even though our time complexity for looking up have we seen one is big O of one, it's efficient. And our time complexity for adding a new one is also big O of one, it's efficient. The memory taken up by this data structure, that problem's not really been addressed at this point. So we have 100% accuracy. We have the ability to do concurrent uh, counting. And we still have a bit of a runaway data or memory problem that is going to bite us at some point, one way or another. So 
in order to address this, we kind of need to think about what's important here. So we need to make some trade-offs. So what, what do we mean by a trade-off? Um, essentially, this is the Wikipedia definition of a trade-off. It's a situational decision involving diminishing or losing one quality or quantity or property in return for gains in something else. So if we look at these two sheep here, imagine that we had the sheep on the left, the sheep on the right takes up less space than the sheep on the left because somebody shaved its uh, fleece off. It's been shorn. Now, hey, it's, it's, hi. We have a question here, okay? Sure. Um, about your the solution you told before. Uh, Vinicius asked, hello, Vinicius. He's my friend, by the way. Um, question, how well would this solution scale? Um, in terms of using a set with Redis, it's going to scale up to the point at which you are able to give Redis memory. So um, part of the way that Redis gets its performance is all of the reads come from memory, which means the entire data set has to live in memory. Um, it's also using a single key in Redis for storing all of the data, which means you would have a problem with like sharding that across multiple clusters. So it will scale well up until the server's memory limit um, and the performance of it will be fine. It's just your memory is gonna get, you're gonna need a lot of memory basically if you're counting lots and lots and lots of things and you need to remember that you've counted them potentially forever. If you're counting lots of things every day and then like deleting the key because tomorrow's a new day and we start counting those things again from scratch, then you are, you know, you're gonna have a longer lifespan. Okay, thank you. you what, go ahead what, what, okay, so, what we'll look at is how we can make some, uh, as I was saying, trade-offs, which um, which will help here. So the sheep, the sheep on the left, imagine that's taking up quite a bit of space because it's got a fleece on it. So by space, it could mean it's physically taking up space in a trailer or a field or somewhere that we're keeping it. Or it might be, imagine it's like a JPEG image. It might be taking up bytes to store all the detail on this. The sheep on the right is kind of different. Um, we've shorn the fleece off of it, which you know, is something that happens to sheep. Uh, but also, you could say that we've reduced the resolution of it or remembered less things about it, but we still know it's a sheep and we could probably still tell it from the other sheep. Um, so it's probably okay that we've lost the detail of that fleece. So if you imagine these two sheep were like JPEG images, the one at the right might be at a different compression level to the one on the left, so it's taking up less storage space. Um, so one of the trade-offs that we want to look at here is um, we've got a storage problem still. So the reason why we've got a storage problem is we have said that we need 100% accuracy. So the two things we need to trade off here are storage versus accuracy. And that's when uh, probabilistic data structures can help us. So let's sort of talk a moment about what probabilistic data structures actually are. Um, up until now, we've been using essentially deterministic or what you might think of as normal data structures. You put 10 things in there and you've got 10 things in there and you can get the 10 things back out again. Um, they are predictable and perfectly good for a lot of situations. In fact, they're definitely what you want for a lot of situations. In other situations, you don't necessarily want that and you have to make some of these trade-offs. And quite often, the trade-offs that you want to look at in data structures are trading some accuracy with functionality and storage efficiency. So like these three corners can be pulled around and the triangle can be reshaped. So you can't have everything. So if you're going to uh, gain some storage efficiency, you might have to give up some functionality and possibly also some accuracy. And if you want to gain some accuracy, you're going to lose some storage efficiency. So um, the idea of a probabilistic data structure is that it makes some of these trade-offs such that you get answers that are good enough for your use case, but not necessarily perfect. So in short, they'll mostly tell the truth about the data set, but sometimes they lie. And the upside of the lying sometimes is 
that you're potentially saving a lot of something else that really matters. So storage or in our case, it's going to be storage. So we're going to have a look at two of these. Um, the first one is something called a hyperloglog, log, which is kind of a cool and interesting name. Um, it's both an algorithm and a data structure. And what it does is it allows us to solve the count distinct problem. So how many sheep have I seen by not actually bothering with being 100% accurate, but by doing an approximation. So the way that a lot of these uh, data structures, the probabilistic ones work is they don't store the actual data. They store a hash of the data because it's more efficient and it's going to save us a lot of storage because instead of storing like distinct strings, we are running them through a number of hashing functions and we're storing the output of those functions. So usually in some sort of bit array. So the, the sheep ID tag would get reduced to a sequence of one and zeros, one for like each hash function. And we would store those in like a fixed width bit array. And then we have a very compact data structure. The downside of this is like with all hashing things, you may well, well, you will get clashes. So some items will hash to the same uh, number of bit positions as other items. And then you won't be able to tell the difference between them. The, this does give you a lot of space efficiency. Um, so that's a benefit. Another benefit with the hyperloglog log is it's got a very similar programming interface to a set. So if you've built something with a set and you find you've got a runaway memory problem and you can live with losing some accuracy, then you can swap in a hyperloglog log very easily. Um, there's also something on here that I've put in as a benefit and a trade-off. So it's a benefit and potentially a downside. And that is that you can't get the items back again. So when I had the set, I was able to do S members on the set key name in Redis, get all of those items back again. And with a hyperloglog, log, I can't because the actual data has been hashed away. So that's a, a trade-off because I've lost some functionality, but it's also potentially a benefit in some situations because I'm not remembering the sort of unique, distinct, um, identifying thing about each thing that I've seen. And in some situations that might be better because if we're tracking, say, ad impressions on mobile network devices, I might not want to remember the IDs that I've seen for uh, privacy reasons, but I might want to know how many of them approximately I've seen. And this, the hashing is gonna help us with that. So the other trade-offs are this data structure isn't built into most programming languages, Python included. And it's not built into many databases, but obviously we have a, a solution for that. Um, the hyperloglog log algorithm is actually semi-complex. Um, I'm not gonna go into how it works in detail, but roughly what it does is it hashes each data item that we're adding using at least one or sometimes more hash functions. It then looks at the resulting stream of zeros and ones that come out of that and counts the number of leading zeros. And there's a formula you can use that approximates the overall size of the data set from seeing lots of members of it and, and looking at how many leading zeros there are in the, in the data. This can be kind of, uh, this can be misrepresentative. So if you see a, an item very quickly that has a large number of leading zeros, then you might think the data set is huge and need to see more samples for that. The way that a hyperloglog log algorithm actually works is it buckets these things into uh, different buckets of numbers of leading zeros according to a few bits at the start of the, the hashed value. So that would be like the bucket number and then say six leading zeros. And for each bucket, it maintains a number of leading zeros it's seen. And then the actual estimate of how many things that there are is an average of those. Um, I'm not a mathematician. I won't go into how that works in great detail, but I would recommend using a library for it rather than building your own. Um, and we'll see both a library and a database implementation. So back to how many sheep have I seen? Let's have a go at approximating how many sheep I've seen using a hyperloglog. log. So 
Here I've got a library for Python that just came from PyPy and it implements the hyperloglog uh, data structure and algorithm. So I import that and I'm gonna compare it with a set. So we set up a sheep scene, which is a set and a sheep scene HLL, a hyperloglog. And part of this library is it allows me to configure my sort of error rate. So the closer, the more accurate I wanna be, the more memory I'm gonna use and the less accurate I wanna be, the less memory I'm gonna use. So I can configure my error rate. I simply just go into a big loop and add 100,000 sheep IDs and um, add them to both the set and the hyperloglog. And we can see the interface is basically identical as an add function. And at the end, I just asked Python, what's the length of both of these data structures? And it'll tell us. Um, the difference here is gonna be that the set is gonna be completely accurate. So as we'd expect, there are 100,000 sheep in the set. Um, the hyperloglog, log, because it's done this thing with the hashing and bucketing and figuring out leading zeros in the data set once it's hashed, um, it's gonna have either hash clashes or get it slightly wrong sometimes. And it's in a good ballpark. So we're at 100,075. So we've slightly overcounted with the hyperloglog. log. Does this matter? Well, depends what your use case is. If you're doing something like counting likes on a social media post, and this saves you a lot of memory, then yeah, that's fine. You could report both of those things as 100K. If you're counting votes in a general election or something, then this is not fine and you should use the set. Um, so again, trade-offs. So the hyperloglog log here has saved us a lot of memory. And when we look at using Redis, we'll see how much memory. Um, and using it in Redis is also pretty straightforward. So Redis is unusual is in that it has a hyperloglog log built into it. It's in the core, it's one of the core data types. You don't need a module or anything for it. So again, here I am adding my uh, sheep to a Redis set like we saw before. I'm also then using what's called the PF add command down there. So hyperloglog log commands in Redis all begin with PF, which are the initials of Philippe Flagellet, the French mathematician that partly came up with the, the algorithm. So we're adding to both of these data structures. And then at the bottom there, I'm just saying, hey Redis, how many things have you seen in the set? What's the memory usage of it? How much memory does it take up on the server? And then the same for the hyperloglog. log. So how many things have you seen and what's the memory usage? And hopefully what we'd see when we run this is that the sets accurate uses a relatively large amount of memory and the hyperloglog log is not far off and uses dramatically less memory. So when I run this, what we see is as expected, the set used 100,000 or the set said 100,000 sheep, exactly right and it used about 4.6 megabytes of memory. Um, the hyperloglog, log on the other hand, slightly undercounted in this case. So it said 99,565 sheep, it's pretty close, but it only used 12 kilobytes of memory. And the way that hyperloglogs logs are implemented in Redis, that's how they're gonna work, is you will get an approximate count. Um, I think there's a standard deviation of like 0.81 and the memory usage is basically going to be 12K. So you can put stuff in this all day and the memory usage will be 12K. Um, whereas if we kept going with that sheep uh, set, we would quite quickly build up a very large data structure, which may or may not matter. If we're building up a single data structure for some whole data set, we can probably afford that. But if we were something like medium.com and we had hundreds of thousands or millions of users and we wanted to store for each of those, like all the IDs of the articles that they've ever read, then that's gonna become a big problem very quickly because now we have you know, this set data structure times our number of users times the number of articles they read. And that become a problem even if you're using an in uh, a disk-based database, but obviously for an in-memory database, you would need enough memory to store all of this. So the hyperloglog log here is saving us a lot of memory at the cost of a little bit of accuracy, and that's probably okay. So the second 
problem that we had that we wanted uh, an answer for is have we seen this sheep? Um, so the set membership question. And again, with a set, we're always going to get perfect answer because we were keeping the the original data. So it's just a case of finding the data in the set and saying yes or no. And as we saw with Redis sets, that's extremely efficient anyway. It's a big O of one operation. So it comes down to what was the problem? Again, it was the memory consumption can become a problem over time. So for this, we are going to use something called a Bloom filter. Um, I'm going to look at how that works in a Python library and how it works in Redis, where it is an add-on module. Something called Redis Bloom adds additional probabilistic data structures to Redis. But the way the Bloom filter works is we're going to take each sheep ID or each thing that we want to remember and run it through a number of hash functions. And the aim of the hash function is to generate a number that's evenly distributed across the positions in a bit array that we've allocated for our Bloom filter. So here I've got a relatively small bit array. It's 15 bits. So the storage capacity of, or the storage requirement in memory of it would be 15 bits. And I'm using three hash functions. So H1, H2, and H3. Each of those are going to output, hopefully, a uniform distribution of 0 to 14 and minimize our, our hash clashes, our hash collisions. But obviously, collisions are going to happen. So imagine I'm storing a sheep ID in my Bloom filter here. And it's sheep ID 1009. So when we run it through hash function 1, it maps to position 1 there. Um, if we run it through the next hash function, it maps to that position further along and so on. So 1009 maps to those three positions. And that's how we're going to store it and remember that we've seen it. So if I add another one, so 9107, uh, H1 for that returns a position that was already set. So we don't need to set that bit to 1. And there's two new bits that are set from the output of H2 and H3. So I've now got two things in my Bloom filter. My storage requirement is still the 15 bits that it was in the first place because we've that's how much we've allocated. And I can keep adding things. So if I add a third thing, so if I add 1458 here, um, 1458 hashes to three positions that were already set to one. So no new positions are set to one here. Um, this is OK because we will still be able to tell that we've seen 1458. And we'll look at how that works. Um, but it's starting to get interesting in that what you can see is 1458 doesn't require any new storage. So we've been able to, on the face of it, remember something without using any storage. And obviously, there's no free lunch. So this is a trick that's going to partly bite us later. So that's how I add things to a Bloom filter. If I want to look things up, we kind of do the opposite, um, starting with a sheep ID or an ID of something that we think might be in there. We run the hash functions, and we get the positions. And if we hit a bit that is not set to 1, so an unset bit, then we absolutely know that that item is not in the Bloom filter because nothing is hashed to that bit. That item can't be in there. If we get a 1, then we can say, or if we get a 1 for each of the positions, then we can say maybe it's in there. So 2045 there, we can say with absolute certainty, is not in the Bloom filter because only one of the three positions hashed to a, to a 1. 9107 here, we did add to the Bloom filter. So when we run 9107 through those hashes again, we get three ones. We know it's in there. Now, 2989 here is a little bit problematic. So 2989, for whatever reason, hashes to these three positions. Those three positions all have a one in. So we should have seen that item but actually if you look up the top we haven't so the reason why we've got ones in those positions is because other ids hash to each of those positions so 2989 here is a false positive so what the bloom filter can tell us is this may be in the bloom filter but i don't know and in this case it's lying so 9107 it'll say it may be in the bloom filter and it, and it was we did put it in there but 2989, no, it isn't. 
Whereas 2045 absolutely isn't because it had two positions that didn't hash to a what. So one of the ways that we can scale and figure out how much Bloom filter we need is there's some variables we can play with here. If we know a few things about how many items we want to store and an acceptable error rate, there's formulae we can run for how wide that bit array should be. And the more hash functions we add, the more positions we'll get, the less chance of an overall clash, but there's computational complexity with running those hash functions. So we have some trade-offs to play with it, even in designing this, this structure, as well as the trade-off of losing some accuracy for a lot of space gain. So we want to look at two, uh, two ways of implementing the Bloom filter. So both of those, which you can use a library or Redis in one case. So there's a library called PyProbables that implements a lot of probabilistic data structures in memory in Python, so in your process. Um, adding the Bloom filter is very simple. We just import it, we configure it with, we tell it how many elements we roughly think we're gonna store in it and what an acceptable false positive rate for us would be. And it figures out how big the Bloom filter needs to be. Um, you can also pass it alternative hash functions and all sorts. I just went with the, the built-in ones to keep this example simple. And then we're going to use an add method to add IDs into the Bloom filter. We're going to add 100,000 of those. And then we're going to see if we've seen some of them. Um, so you would hope that it would say, yes, I've seen 9018, or I may have seen 9018, because it can't say with absolute certainty it has, because that's in the 0 to 100,000 range. I just hope that it says, no, I've not seen 454991. Um, so moving this logic to Redis, because obviously this, this memory implementation still has a, uh, a problem of only one, uh, one process can access it at a given time and the memory's inside the process. So we wanna, we wanna have this in our database really so we can share it. So, with Redis, we can install the Redis Bloom module onto the server. And as I say, that gives us extra commands for probabilistic data structures. And we can write some code that looks like this. So instead of um, using a set, so yeah, instead of using a set, we're gonna use the Bloom filter and we're gonna tell Redis Bloom that we want to bf.reserve or Bloom filter reserve a filter at a given key and similarly to what we saw with the python library we can pass in a desired error rate and an approximate amount of items we want to store in there and it will figure out how much space it needs for that and allocate it for us then adding things very simple as a command bf so all the bloom filter commands begin with bf dot so bf dot add and we just give it an id and it goes away and hashes it and puts it in the bloom filter and then we use bf.exists to see if we've seen that item before. And again, it will say, I might have seen that item, or there's a strong probability I have, or no, I absolutely haven't seen that item. So if we run that, then again, you'll sort of see what you'd expect. It might have seen one that hash two or ones and one that had a zero in its, its hash positions. It's definitely not seen. So that was kind of a quick tour of, of two of the popular probabilistic data structures, but when should we actually use these things? Is, are the trade-offs okay? Um, I mean, generally you want to use a hyperloglog log if approximation is good enough. So you're going to save a lot of memory and you want to use it for things like I say, social media likes where you, know, you see on Instagram, it says like 2.4K likes. We don't really care if it's 2,422 or 2,700 and whatever, as long as it's in the right ballpark. Um, don't use this for financial accounting or something where absolute accuracy matters. Um, and with a Bloom filter, use it for things where it's okay if you have some false positives some of the time. Um, so that might be for things like recommending articles. So if I was medium and I had a, a set of everything that I'd ever read on Medium, then you might want a recommendation algorithm that says recommend things that aren't in that set, so stuff that Simon hasn't seen already. 
storing that per user is very expensive um, and it could just go on forever. So using a bloom filter for that would save a lot of space because it pulls it down to just that bit array, a bit of computation with hash functions. And sometimes it's going to be wrong and sometimes it will recommend me an article I've read already. And that's probably okay because I don't pay for medium. So my expectations are that it's reasonably good. And also that's not like a life or death decision. The fact that they recommend me something I've read already very occasionally doesn't really matter. And it, you know, the savings for their infrastructure would be huge. Um, you also need to think about if you need to get the original data back again. So if you do need to use this as both a database as well as a set membership and cardinality checker, then this is not for you. You should probably use the set or something where you actually get the original data back again or store the original data somewhere else. Because these, this approach, we're going to hash the data away. It's not going to be there anymore. And then finally, some data sets are just so large or never ending that actually having exact strategies doesn't make sense in the first place. So use them in that situation. So if you're tracking things like, you know, the classic temperature, humidity in a room where sensors are reporting it every minute or something, it's never gonna end. And do you really need to know an exact number of things that you've already received? Probably not. So again, some example use cases for both of these uh, data structures. And Interesting one for the Bloom filter would be something like checking if a username's already taken. So if you have a service that people sign up for and they give you a username, then you can use a Bloom filter to check if it's already taken with a reasonably high degree of accuracy. Um, and this is interesting because if you would take the bits for a Bloom filter after you've loaded all the data into it and you know what the hash functions are, you can move that whole data structure into the browser in the front end and perform these checks, you know, as, as someone presses each individual key as a sort of type ahead for like that username might be taken or isn't without constantly going back to a server. So taking it out of the Redis context, that that's quite an interesting use for that data structure. Um, the other thing that people use them for is to try and avoid performing unnecessary other operations. So if you have something where the data is stored on disk and you don't know if you've you've got that data, then running it through a Bloom filter to see if there's a strong likelihood you have can be a good way of determining whether you need to make that disk access or not. Um, similarly for hyperloglogs, logs, they get used for approximating things like IP addresses that have accessed certain resources on a network. And that might be part of like intrusion detection software. There's use cases for this in, in fraud, for example. Um, and then more common things are things like tracking ads, um, where you don't want the individual uh, user identifiable item storing and an approximate amount of traffic to an ad is is good enough. So finally, we looked at two probabilistic data structures, uh, both generally in the family of these things and in the Redis Bloom module. So in the world of probabilistic data structures that you can install and run in Redis, there's a few more. So um, this talk doesn't cover these but there's something called a cuckoo filter, which is basically like a uh, Bloom filter. It has a couple of differences. It allows you to delete items and it's optimized for uh, checking membership more than adding new items. So if you have a use case where you don't add items very often, but you check whether they exist quite a lot, then a cuckoo filter might be a better approach. It's basically the same as a Bloom filter from a programming perspective. There's something called a count min sketch in there as well. Um, what that does is it approximates the frequency of events in a stream, which basically means if you have a stream of data coming in and you want to see every time, I don't know, say it's a hotel and you've got sensors on all the doors, every time a certain room door opens, then you can use a count min sketch to approximate that without having to store all instances of that room door ever opening, uh, which might be a yeah, it's a never-ending stream, so there, there will be 
literally no end to that data set. So storing it accurately doesn't necessarily mean anything. And finally, there's what's called a top K in there. So you can use that to, from again, a stream of data, maintain a list of the however many most frequently seen things that you want to record. So if I had, for example, that hotel example, and I had uh, sensors on all of the doors, and I knew which door number was being opened, I might want to maintain a list of the top 10 doors that get opened in the hotel for some reason, like which rooms are people going in and out of all the time. Um, so these are all available to you in the uh, Redis Bloom module that's an add-on for the, the Redis server. And you can also get it in the Redis Labs, Redis Cloud, which yeah, obviously I work for Redis Labs. We'd love for you to use our cloud service. Others are available, but um, if you want to use this, then it's just a click and, and go. So that, I think, was everything that I had today. So thanks very much. Hopefully, this has been kind of an interesting, if somewhat whirlwind, introduction to um, probabilistic data structures, but also into thinking about problems that, on the face of it, look quite simple. So we all know how to count things. We can all do that on our fingers or toes or whatever we want to choose to count on. Um, but when we actually try doing this in real world situations, there are complexities and things to consider. Um, and hopefully it's helped you understand how Redis can issue with this sort of thing and be a really easy drop into potentially an existing code base. So thank you very much. <laughs> okay, thank you, Simon. We have this huge Charlotte comment. Great talk, thanks. <laughs> thank you. And I <clears throat> make her words mine. That was a, a great talk. You said that is a long version of your one of your talks, right? Yeah, the um, the original version was 25 minutes, so it goes a lot faster and has less stuff in it or more stuff to look up afterwards. Um, but yeah, hopefully we were able to cover, you know, everybody wants to be right all the time. And we're kind of told that that's a good thing. And sometimes it isn't. And especially in the sort of world now where we have all of this data that's coming at us all the time and we need to summarize and aggregate it, we have to make some trade-offs sometimes. So this is just a really interesting family of data structures that you can dig into and tune and mess around with. Um, and the fact that they lie to you sometimes is potentially a good thing, which is an unusual thing to say. <laughs> yeah, not usually at all. And the with trade-offs is part of our lives and every day we do with it. Um, Vinicius said, great explanation. Uh, it was... So, guys, if you have any questions, just comment and Simon will try to ask you all, to try to answer you all. One thing that I can show you as well okay. is I, let's see if we can find this really quickly. Hey, let's come out of my slides and go to here. No, she's not working. Uh, that's what we want. So I'm used to using PowerPoint, and this is Keynote. So one thing I did build is, um, and you can see it on my website, it's kind of a very visual thing, so I won't run through the demo here, is I built uh, a hardware bloom filter, because obviously they're just bits, and one of the cool ways of, of seeing how they work is to, um, how is it not going to be? Great, let's just kill this animalness. I built a hardware balloon filter on a Raspberry Pi with an LED matrix. So as you enter things into this front end here, it actually stores them in the state of the LED matrix. So each thing that you add, let's find a place where this is going to work for us. It 
each thing that you add starts setting more and more um more and more leds red which a symbol which symbolizes a full position in the bloom filter and then when you look things up they flash green if they're already occupied so this is kind of a fun video to watch article to read that explains it is um how it works in a very very visual way because it's hard to to see sort of computer memory um, um, have a question here. How could this be used in the distributed system or IoT context? Okay. Um, yeah, I actually used to work for an IoT company that when I said putting sensors on hotel doors, we actually did put sensors on hotel doors and stuff like that, um, as well as on uh, the air conditioner to determine what's going on and so on. And part of the, the problem with some of these systems is imagine we're doing like air conditioning control and we have all of this iot stuff that sends data to the cloud and the cloud says turn the air conditioner off in this room and on in this room and down and up in that if it gets disconnected from the internet then you've got like the iot gateway which could be something very basic like a raspberry pi it needs to take over and make sensible decisions about these things so having it have a summary of the data set in a more space efficient way is really advantageous even if it's wrong sometimes because like if i'm storing say room occupancy in a bloom filter and i'm storing the door numbers and basically if the door numbers in there it's occupied then my sort of pretty dumb raspberry pi with not much memory can make decisions about whether the aircon should be on in that room based on whether it's occupied have we seen somebody in there recently without having to store every single event like the cloud would when it's making better decisions about that, but still making some decision about it when you don't have access to the cloud is, is better than doing nothing. Um, I think also just IoT stuff generally leads to streams of data that never, never end. And querying those streams of data can be expensive or you have to wait a while until some aggregation process has made sense of them and then pull from the aggregates. So a probabilistic data structure that stores like some sort of summary of the data but is not 100% accurate might be very helpful there for making faster decisions. I know that people use that in things like fraud detection, for example, where you just have this stream of events coming through and you want to capture like roughly the say the top five uh, purchase events on this card and not have to remember all of them because the fraud system has to make a decision very, very quickly when a transaction goes through, am I going to allow this or not? It hasn't got time to go query a data warehouse and churn lots of, of uh, data over. And if it's wrong sometimes and you get the odd transaction that's declined, that's probably safer than letting some through that shouldn't be. Okay. Thank you for your answer. No problem. So yeah, I'll just uh, share some, kind of, I'm sure somebody else has shared this this week, but it's, um, if you're interested in learning more about Redis, we have Redis University here and I kind of run that for my day job. So we have all of these courses. We would love to see people sign up and, uh, and take them. They're all free. Okay, I would just, Paste the address in the comments. It's right there. Thanks. Yeah, everything's free. It's all open source Redis and it's all online. So. Yeah, and if you want to keep in touch with Simon, all his social medias is in the, the video description. Just, mm -hmm. just here. Thank you very much. Yep. Okay. So I think, oh, Vinicius said, great answer, thanks. I think we won't have any more questions. So you have anything more to say, Simon? Okay, no, thank you very much. And uh, thanks for organizing this and um, really enjoyed doing it. So it's now 1 a.m. my time, so I'm gonna uh, <laughs> <laughs> close down and go to bed, but thank you so much. Okay. Um, Thank you so much for your time, for your literally time zone. And we appreciate your content. We like it very much. Um, I hope we come with us more time. 
yeah, thank you. We'll see you next time. Okay. So thank you for everyone who stayed here. And stay tuned for more. Um, just check out our social medias. And I think that's it. That's it, Simon. Thank you. Good night. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.